Again, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for our fourth session in the uh, Community Foundation of the Virgin Islands grant from the National Endowment Humanities under the CARES Act to develop the St. Thomas Graphics Collection. The title of this presentation today, The Printing Press and Community Memory, Virgin Islands History, Culture, Socioeconomics, and Politics Archived in the St. Thomas Graphics Collection will present, be presented by Senator Myron D. Jackson and Ruby Simmons uh, Sanison, Dr. Ruby Simmons Sanison. Senator Jackson and Dr. Simmons will illustrate the importance of preserving our written and printed history, which is so critical and significant in the preservation of our collective memory. Senator Jackson began involvement in culture and politics um, long ago, he's in response to enthusiastic encouragement by the public. He took on leadership of the 32nd Legislature of the Virgin Islands as president and the 33rd Legislature as vice president with a strong commitment to be true to service, a value passed on to him by his parents. He is a graduate of Charlotte Amali High School in 1975 and the Parsons School of Design in New York in 1979. Senator Jackson has remained active in civic organizations and in government throughout his life, dedicating his work to the protection of the cultural resources and the advancement of cultural heritage in the territory. In the 30th to 33rd legislatures, Senator Jackson served as the chair of the Committee on Culture, Historic Preservation, Youth and Recreation. He was also a delegate to the Fifth Constitutional Convention. Dr. Ruby Simmons Sanison, a native Virgin Islander and a lifelong educator, has been a researcher, a genealogist, and a community activist for most of her adult life. Her professional life involves service for the Virgin Islands, at, starting at as, as an English teacher in the Virgin Islands public school system, including two terms as a senator in the legislature of the Virgin Islands, and as a delegate to the third and fourth Virgin Islands constitutional conventions including serving as vice president of the fourth, and also as a commissioner of the Virgin Islands Department of Education. She taught at the University of Virgin Islands, attaining the rank of associate professor, professor of English and serving as chair of the humanities division and chair of the faculty. Her interest in genealogy began over 50 years ago when she started taking notes as she interviewed two of her mother's uncles. And since then, she has avidly researched her, the roots of her family and has also assisted friends and colleagues with their genealogical research. The written and printed word from time immortal has been of man's greatest invention. And from the chiseled cast stone and painted hieroglyphs inscribed on edifices of ancient Kemet temples, tombs, statues, functional art items, and inscribed papyrus scroll texts, our ancient ancestors recorded their way of life no, their spirituality I'm, and their humanity. I'm, I'm all this stuff back together, but I'm not do it. In Senator Jackson's words, okay. in a modern context, on a daily basis, we too continue this tradition by our use of the working tools of various inventions to inscribe our thoughts, actions, deeds, and collective memory. That will be the topic of today's deep dive into some of, of the materials in the St. Thomas Graphics Collection. Senator Jackson and Dr. Ruby Simmons-Assonison's talk today will last about one hour. It will include slides and will be followed by a Q&A session. They ask that you hold your questions until the end, at which time we will moderate a question and answer session. So with no further ado, I pass over session today to Senator Jackson. Thank you. Please. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules uh, to join us this afternoon for this lecture on the, um, by the Caribbean Genealogy Library that specifically deals with the collection of the St. Thomas graphic that was deposited in the Caribbean Genealogy Library. I've had the opportunity to 
go through it, uh, not all of it, but what's available. Um, and I was really struck with just the various items that are deposited in the collection. Uh, I love old photographs. I love photographs, period. And I just found many of the photographs to be very compelling and they tell a story. It's a picture tells a thousand words. But in addition to that, uh, all the other materials, the booklets and the magazines and the publications and the testimonial and funeral booklets that also come out of the collection. So um, joining me today is Dr. Ruby Simmons E. Sanderson, and we're going to have a conversation with you um, as two individuals who come out of a community uh, known as the Upstreet community, uh, which has very um, broad boundaries uh, defined by the organization We From Upstreet Incorporated that was formed 25 years ago. I, uh, for residents and former residents and those who live in the community today to have an organization that can address the needs of the community and likewise preserve its collective memory. So in going through the collection, I recognize that the organization did use the St. Thomas graphic uh, to archive its memory. And I thought, um, when I was asked to do the presentation, I said, well, how can I make a creative presentation that speaks to the community to which the St. Thomas graphic um, business was located, which was an upstreet hospital ground. And that likewise, Ruby and I, or Dr. Simmons and I come out of that community and in using our collections and our collective memory, tie this collection to why it's important uh, to preserve our oral history and our collective memory. So in that regard, I'll share, I'll start with the presentation and welcome uh, Dr. Simmons and thank you for being my co-host this afternoon. Good afternoon. And <clears throat> thank you for asking me to, to join you in this effort. And I'm gonna suggest something um, because we're gonna get tangled up on Senator and Dr. You're Myron and I'm Ruby, and I think everybody who's in this presentation, they know us well enough that we can call each other by our first names. Yes. Makes it a lot easier. Very good. <laughs> so without any further ado, let's see if we could get this uh, share. Okay, so I need to go to the beginning of my presentation. Uh, Okay, can everyone see that? Yeah. Yes. Okay, okay, very well. So, um, the introduction explained uh, what angle we are coming from in reference to our presentation today, the print and press and community memory, Virgin Islands history, culture, socioeconomics, and politics archived in the St. Thomas Graphic Collection. I want to say to you, this is part one of part two, because we quickly realized that we did not have enough time to cover all of the subject matter today. So we're going to focus on history and culture today. And uh, the written and printed word from Time Immortal has been one of man's greatest inventions from chisel, cast stone, and painted hieroglyphs inscribed and edifices of ancient Kim. Kemet temples, tombs, monuments, functional art items, and inscribed papyrus scroll texts. Our ancient ancestors recorded their way of life, their spirituality, and their humanity. In a modern context, on a daily basis, we too continue this tradition by our use of modern working tools of various inventions to inscribe our thoughts. And here is an illustration of ancient Egypt and one of the temples with inscribed text. In the previous session uh, presentation, uh, Mrs. Susan Lugo 
who was once a territorial archivist, did a wonderful job of giving an overview of the collection and likewise the art of printing. And here she is uh, when we had uh, members of the Danish National Museum that visited the territory when she was a territorial archivist and visited the uh, collection, the archives in the Van, not in the Enid Bar Library. And you could see some of the covers from various uh, magazines and publications and testimonials, and then the letterpress and the a type that was used uh, throughout printing. I had the opportunity to actually work with St. Thomas Graphic as a, an artist uh, on several occasions. And I'll speak to that in terms of that experience as well. Uh, collective memory. My lecture will illustrate the importance of preserving our written and printed history, which is so critical significant for the preservation of our collective memory. Collective memory as defined refers to the shared pool of memories, knowledge and information to a social group that is significantly associated with the group's identity. The St. Thomas Graphic Collection is a treasure trove of Virgin Islands history, culture and the identity of a people and a narrative of a local printing press that transformed a community's oral and written history and their efforts to preserve their collective history. Uh, in us putting this presentation together, uh, Ruby came across um, a poem by J. Antonio Jarvis entitled The Printing Press. And at this time, she'll share it with us. Good afternoon again. And I just should point out that um, <clears throat> I did my dissertation on three Virgin Islands writers, including Jarvis. And so I am very familiar with his work and I realized that he did have something called the printing press. And most of us know that Mr. Jarvis was involved in printing and publication himself. So the printing press, this tortured iron shaped by human hands has grown a soul its vast existence makes or mars the destinies of man and fills his waking moment, moments with its cares and joys. These silent type of senseless lead can form a searing language or perchance record the soft angelic tone that lovers use. Together, urged by masterminds, they move ambassadors and armies to and fro. They show to each half how the other lived. They changed the precedence of centuries. They lit the darkened world and let it on. Henceforth must mankind reckon with the press till both shall sink to death and nothingness. Thank you, Ruby. And it's very appropriate for our lecture today. And it speaks also to the volume of work that uh, many of our ancestors, Virgin Islanders, have left that we are not familiar with and we should become familiar with. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Dr. Emmanuel at Rico Center at one of the programs where uh, the children from our public schools, I think this is Janie Tewitt School, uh, Janie Tewitt, I think this is Ola Mala, uh, came uh, for our program and he was. Uh, sharing stories, storytelling, Bru Nancy, Bru Tokama, and other folk tales. And then uh, in this soloette, uh, you see uh, young people uh, participating in the Little League at the Emil Griffith Park. And the collective memory is so important because much of that is developed as, we, as from children to adulthood, but most times your memory will be that you experience as a child. And 2017 marked the 100th anniversary of the sale and transfer of the Danish West Indies and the people. And these images are very important uh, to our collective memory. We have the holiday March 31st every year. And as the 100 year mark has passed, Many say, why are we celebrating 
of observing this benchmark in our history. I think for those of us of a certain age that had grandparents who were born in the Danish West Indies or parents who were born in the early American period, like my mom, who is now 93, who was born in 1928. They're the first generation of American Virgin Islanders. And that their parents and grandparents' status was also linked to our struggles for self-determination and um, as it relates to status today and um, our, con well, our development for a constitution and our relationship to the United States. But if you don't understand the history, you will be somewhat lost in that debate and discussion. So here are images uh, that come from the US National Archives from the early American period. One is a document presented to the naval government, and that was the uh, governance of the time, the naval administration, and then we went to um, a civil administration. They are requesting a passport to travel outside of the Virgin Islands. In the middle, these are images from those passports. And you have uh, beautiful images that have been um, recolored uh, from black and white to color by the artist Janet Rodnick of St. John. Uh, they did an exhibition for the centennial. And I think we can all agree they're just beautiful images of the soul and the people of the time who were leaving the Virgin Islands uh, to go to the United States and other parts of the world. The other document is a United States citizen's identification card for insular travel uh, of a couple that I will speak to, which is Mr. and Mrs. Oliver. They were educators and they lived on the street to which my grandparents lived, as well as Ruby's great-grandparents and grandparents. My first encounter with the St. Thomas Graphic was through a publication uh, that was commissioned by Mrs. Arona Peterson. I was in Charlotte Armley High School at the time. I was in my, I was in, a, I think my senior year. And uh, I was part of the art department and the art director and my instructor was Mrs. Edith Woods. It was a big task because I had never illustrated a book before. And uh, she lived a couple houses from my family residence and she knew my family well. And I can't say that we are related because we haven't really traced, been able to trace if in fact we are DNA connected because of my mother's family of Petersons. And um, it led to a discussion and at the time she had a restaurant at her residence and you had to, you just didn't go to this restaurant. You had to make reservations and she would prepare the culinary arts of the Virgin Islands and the Caribbean. So she was well noted as a culinary expert. And in getting to better know her, she started to share that she had these stories and she wanted to memorialize these stories into writing, these oral history stories that were passed down to her from her great grandmother to her mother. And that likewise, she would want to have these, a collection of these stories for future generations. And that began a collaborative work. So I started the illustrations after reading each story. Uh, she had previously written Herbs and Proverbs, which gives her knowledge of local herbs, as well as uh, proverbs that we don't use as much anymore in our language arts. Monkey know what treat the claim. Uh, cockroach ain't have no business in foul house. Uh, you could chew your tobacco, but mind where you spit. These were proverbs that were shared by our elders to 
teach us uh, to walk the straight and narrow line. And if you wobbled, you know, it, it may be, it's okay, but as long as you didn't do damage to others or do injury to others. So as a result of that, she put as many of these proverbs in her book with the use of local herbs. This is uh, from Creole Catch and Keep, and these are some of the illustrations for each story. Mama Sophie, Bim, which uh, speaks to our elder, um, going about her daily tasks and having challenges. Bim Bim, which is a very common story about a man who turns into a bo bohag, but he gets the hands, uh, he asks for the hand of marriage of a young maiden and is uh, her brother with the one with the flute uh, felt uneasy about him and decided that he should keep an eye on him. And as a result of doing so, he saw him turning into a bohag. So he warned his parents and her that this man was not of no good. Uh, the other one, you would you like to hear a duck story? And uh, that was one that was passed on to her. And she took also a license to modernize these stories as well. Uh, Cousin Liza, new suit. And then you see other illustrations belonging to the various stories. So there were a time period. So you would see the carriage, the long row house, uh, the vernacular cottage, uh, the rocking chair, the local broom, the, the press in the house, which is a amwa, we call it press, that most households would have at the time. Uh, we didn't have closets. You had a bedstead, whether it be iron, mahogany, or uh, some other sort. Uh, but a, a amwa, or press as we call it locally, would be a very important piece of furniture in your home. And usually these were given to you and you got married by your parents or, or your husband-to-be. My second encounter with the St. Thomas Graphic Collection was one of a real tragedy for my fa family was the untimely death of my father, who was uh, shot while he was closing his store in this community, not too far from St. Thomas Graphic. I have an adopted brother who worked at the uh, St. Thomas Graphic at the time by the name of Bernard Phillips. Uh, and it was a decision that St. Thomas Graphic would do the booklet. And it's like those of you that, that have had to do a funeral booklet for a loved one knows that it's a very tedious task that you have to accomplish in a very short time. And as a result of that, uh, you have to get the family photographs, the tributes. And when this booklet was done, it was really in the evolution of funeral booklets. Usually they were just a two-sided printed with the program. But this one gives, you know, the family photographs and um, a biographical sketch and other tributes in it. Uh, so it, it, this is the beginning of the booklets that we see today uh, in a modern context. The third um, opportunity I had was also as a member, a founding member of the We From Up Street organization is celebrating its 25th anniversary and, uh, and its first and second anniversary celebration. It was decided uh, which became a tradition to have a luncheon every year on the anniversary of the founding of the entity, uh, honoring tradition bearers, elders of the community. And in this one was Miss Mary Skelton Francis, who's the mother of Dr. Um, Marilyn Krieger, uh, Dr. Rehinia Ed Gabriel, uh, who, who was an educator and spent her life uh, as an educator within the Department of, uh, Department of Education. Mr. Clark D. Maloon, who was a photographer also from this community and the image on the booklet is his, his photograph. And Mr. Austin Babe Monsanto, who recently passed and the um, Marine Terminal in Subbase's name in his honor. Most of these individuals 
if they weren't born in Upstreet, their parents moved when they were a very young age or they relocated when they were uh, uh, starting their families and which we'll speak to. Uh, the one, the picture with the house on the corner, those of you old enough would know that this is a house that had an ill fate because any car coming down Marfilly Hill, which is now Mart Proudfoot uh, Drive, would end up in this house. And this is in its better days. You could see the, the old part of the house and the new part of the house. So most likely the newer uh, addition or renovations was as a result of a car driving into the exterior porch of the house. It had a, a enclosed porch around the house and was revolutionary for its time as a modern vernacular structure that was built by a member of the Calistro family that had returned from the Dominican Republic. And Ruby, you want to speak to the long row next to, next to it? Sure. Um, if you look at the picture right behind the building that Myron just talked about, there is a building there and that is the very building that housed St. Thomas Graphics. But when I was growing up, and when, when Myron and I started the discussion about today's presentation, we talked about what, that, what was housed in that building at one time. It was Mr. Williams Cafe. There was a gentleman named Mr. Williams who lived on Gold Street, but he had a little rum shop in that building there. And um, many of the men in the community and from other neighborhoods would come there. And I have gone in there, you know, uh, on errands sent by my parents to take something to Mr. Williams or or somebody else. And so that very building is the building that St. Thomas Graphics sat in for the many years that it was a part of, of the community. Ruby, I just wanted to make a correction because the, this, this building is before Mr. Williams. Mr. Williams' building would be next. So I think this is the hairdresser to Oh, that's, the, oh, okay. Yes. Okay, and so it, I was a little bit off, but... Yeah. Um, you see, yeah, I can't see the other building, but anyway, the other experience I have with that building was that a lady by the name of Miss Trotman was a hairdresser. She, she came from the country, the New Hornhut area, but she did hair and my mother used to go to her to get her hair done. And so every, however often my mother went to get her hair done, we would go and sit on the porch in the area, Miss Trotman had one of the rooms and she would do her hair in there. So I don't know how many people, but um, she was, you, many people know Yvonne Francis, that was her aunt, and she's a part of that family. So um, that building served in several capacities, including a hairdresser shop. Thank you, Ruby. This photograph is also a, a, a very rare photograph that shows hospital line. Uh, the Lina Roberts Stadium. It wasn't Lina Roberts Stadium at the time, which was the cricket field because cricket was played at that time. And then in American period, baseball became the popular sport. The J. Antonio Jarvis School, which was then Lincoln School. You're looking into the courtyard. Then we have Princeton's Garda, the streets that our ancestors lived on, uh, which is go was out. Uh, locally known as Gold Street, and at the opposite end is Glass Battle Alley. Gold Street and Glass Battle Alley are Princeton's Gara, King's Quarter, which means Prince Street. The establishment of this community has a very interesting history. It goes back to 1764, 1765 for the growing town of Charlotte Amalia. Um, it was rural. Uh, they laid out uh, the footprint in this area here, which would be the residential community with some commercial activity to include a church or several churches, but the Lutheran church is further down, but the Memorial Moravian Church was built, and we'll talk about that in a few. And then you see all this green area here, open area, which was hospital estate. And likewise in this picture, you see the two cemeteries, the Danish cemetery and the Moravian cemetery. You see the mahogany trees. Uh, there was a race course, a horse race course that's run, um, that 
is the oval that is now um, which, what we call Burke's home in back of the new Hanson Hospital. And then you see the early beginnings of what is the old municipal hospital in the footprint uh, used by Naval. And a picture of Upstreet, one of the earliest that I think we could find, which is the late 18, early 1900s, we say about 1905. It's a very interesting building and uh, attempts are being made now to uh, convert this to a school for the arts where um, artists and tradition bearers would have a place uh, to pass on their traditions and practice their traditions and uh, so that future generations and you can find on the Facebook page, the Virgin Islands uh, Civic and Cultural Center that speaks to the efforts that are being made uh, to convert this building and to build a new museum, Civic and Cultural Center and the footprint of the old Apollo Theater at the bottom of Government Hill. But at the time, this particular picture uh, was after it was repurposed as a hospital and made into a communal school. And you see the school children, the teachers, it had a double staircase in the front with a, a, a archway and the second level. It doesn't look like this today, but we trust and we hope uh, that when we finish with the renovations of this building that we will bring it back to um, the, the beauty of the, that the building is. Um, Myron, before you move from that picture, may I just interject here? That building has gone through several iterations, if you will, because when I was in the sixth grade, I attended sixth grade at what was then Lincoln School, and there was a, a gallery, a porch on the top floor. It had been added on at some point, and then later on it was again taken down because that porch had become unsafe. And so the building has changed its appearance, you know, on several occasions. I just wanted to interject that. Thank you, Ruby. And that is during the American period, the porch was added and it became the Lincoln School. Right. One of the elders of our community uh, that as a child uh, that I had the opportunity to know that whose family was from upstreet, even though he was born in Saban, he later relocated with the marriage uh, to Mrs. Blake, or one of the Blake, Miss Blake, who became Mrs. Gertie. I forgot Miss Blake's, Miss Gertie's first name. Louise. Hey, Louise, thank you, Louise Blake. And this is a photograph of them in New York and they were very active. And there was a Virgin Islands uh, Society Association in New York, very similar to uh, societies in New York today, the Freshwater Yankees. They, uh, the one in Washington, what's the name of the one in Washington, Ruby? Um, Virgin Islands Association of, I think, Maryland, DC and Maryland. Correct, and then we so now I have one. And we have one in Atlanta, I think, now as well. Yes. And in a, in a couple other states, I think in Texas, we recently uh, see the evolution of uh, another Virgin Islands Association. Uh, so Mr. Gertie was very well versed uh, on the community, going back over 100 years, going back to his great grandparents, and likewise um, visiting his grandmother and his you know, other family members. And he wrote this book, Harlem's Danish American West Indians. Most people would think that we out migrated after the sale of the islands, but that's not correct. We started out migrations from the 1800s and we went into communities like Brooklyn, New York, and then later Harlem and Long Island. And these are two of his other books uh, here uh, that, are, um, that he published. This was published, um, Independent Democrat, which I did. I had forgotten he had run from the Senate, but this was published by the St. Thomas Graphic. The other books were not published by them. One of our other elders uh, who also left us in 2018 is Dr. Ruth Molinar. And it was her work, The Legacies of Upstreet, that much of this presentation is also in honor of and this is a photograph of the porch on the 
J. Antonio Jarvis School, which was then Lincoln School, and with the students, and this would be the era of my mother who attended the school and she was one of the May Queens. Uh, they would have every May, the May pole, and they would have a May Queen selected from the school and they would go to the, line, the, the big field at that time. It was not Carolina Rabbit Stadium during this era. And they would have one of the local community bands, Uncle Herman and other musicians that would play uh, for the Maypole. Uh, so here, the entire school population with their teachers on the three uh, porches that were done in concrete during the Naval Administration. And can you tell me where the principal is in this photograph, Ruby? You want, I, I have no idea. <laughs> he is at the back porch. And this is right oh, here. Up there, okay. And he got himself into the photograph as the principal, and that is uh, E. Benjamin Oliver at the time. Mm -hmm. And here is another photograph of it. You could see his outline right here and the school population on, uh, on the balconies or, uh, of the school. And you can see the transformation. Uh, the double staircase is gone, the balconies are there. And uh, these are four length doors and they're not quite the same today. And that leads us to educators of the time. Uh, J. Antonio Jarvis was one of the younger uh, educators. There were older educators and I'll leave Dr. Simmons speak to some of the uh, educators in this photograph. Um, this picture shows many of the people that uh, were the, the foundation, if you will, of education in, in the Virgin Islands. So you see people like Eudora Ken, for whom a school is named. There's also Janie Tuit, uh, Adina Ken. And I guess if I were to go straight across the front, it's Adina Ken. I'm not sure who the one next to her is. She was then from the United States. Okay, and then there's Bertha Buschalta in the middle, Elsra Schulterbrun, uh, Eudora Ken, and the one on the end, I'm not certain who she is. I believe is. that's Miss Williams. Which Miss Williams? Miss Williams lived at the bottom of the hill there by the, the, the Adams family across from our, our family properties. I oh. believe that's Miss Williams. Okay, and then he, behind her, of course, is J. Antonio Jarvis. Yeah. Next to him is John Scott. Then you have Elizabeth Michael, and the gentleman, I am not sure he, who he is. Um, I should know who that lady is also. Yes, it's Mildred, Mildred Andrews. Ms. Andrews, okay. And next to her, can't help you, but I know Janie Tewitt is the other woman there, and I'm not sure who the gentleman at the end is. That's, uh, that's Mr. Donovan. But many of those people, I, some, some of them taught me, and I ended up working with some of them, you know, and I had a chance when I was a Girl Scout, when Janie Tewitt was commissioner of education, I had a chance to be commissioner for the day uh, and sit in her chair long before I actually sat in that seat myself. Anyway. Ms. Austin Donovan's sister was uh, also an educator and what was Washington School was later named for her. And what's, what's, what's the, um? Washington School? Um, it's not yeah. that's Evelyn Marcelli's school, right? Right. So Evelyn Marcelli was Mr. Donovan's sister. Oh, okay. All right. And then here is the book, the controversial book, The Virgin Islands and Their People. As a child, I had heard much about Mr. Jarvis. And uh, when he had written uh, this book, uh, it created such a stir as it relates to him talking about Aubert in Virgin Island society. And it for polite society was not acceptable. And they, in fact, he was, uh, he was really put to, oh, they tried to put him to shame, so to speak. And uh, the publication of this book, they even went as far as trying to censor him. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, wise heads ruled at the end, they wanted to take away his uh, teaching license. And this is a, a sketch of the French community in French town. 
sorry, very sensitive mouse. And uh, that's in the uh, interior of the book, the preface of the book. And uh, I, to read this book, I had to visit, I had to beg my, uh, one of my family members, Miss Emmeline Smedes, who lived at the head of the Pay Street. When we would go and visit her, she, she was my um, grandmother's niece and my, god, my father's godmother. I saw the book and she allowed me to borrow it. And I was just amazed of the information that it provided and the insights on Virgin Islands and their people. And here is J. Antonio Jarvis receiving the medal from President Truman in 1946, the Virgin Islands picture book, J. Antonio Jarvis and Rufus Martin, who was also um, a noted uh, Virgin Islander who was involved in, as a journalist. The Brief History of the Virgin Islands, which was used in schools. Uh, I think it would probably be after Knox, probably a second or third uh, book that was uh, produced for the um, children of our public school system, also private. And then you see a picture from the picture book of the J. Antonio Jarvis School, which, which was then Lincoln School. Um, Mr. Jarvis became a teacher there, even though Mr. Oliver was before him. Many felt the school should have been named for Mr. Oliver instead of Mr. Jarvis. So we have um, the E. Benjamin Oliver School that's out in the Tutu uh, community. Uh, but Mr. Oliver was there before Mr. Jarvis. Uh, and uh, Mr. Jarvis um, eventually became principal of the school. Is that correct? Um, yeah, he was principal when I attended. Um, you have to excuse my clock. Um, yeah, he was a principal when I attended in sixth grade. And um, he was principal for quite quite a while. The, pi the picture that you refer to, I believe, is a, one of his paintings because Jarvis, in addition to being a, a writer, was a musician and an artist and an all around Renaissance man. So uh, he was quite talented. Right, and which is reflected in this um, um, yes. slide. Um, Dr. Ruth Molinar and Ariel Melchior, to whom uh, they were co-owners of the Daily News, the founders of the Daily News, the St. Thomas Daily News today. Uh, they got together with other community members and they had this bus of Jarvis, an educator's park erected. This is his home, which is the home of the We From Upstreet Incorporated. It's a, a house museum and learning center that was restored by the Department of Planning State Historic Preservation Office that was the home of Ambassador Tadman and his wife and Mrs. Doris Tadman uh, took a lot of uh, interest. Uh, I approached her when the property was for sale and asked if she would sell it to the Virgin Islands government, which she did. And we started the process of uh, raising funds and getting appropriation to purchase the building. So uh, it's to be part of a network of uh, cultural sites uh, throughout the territory celebrating and honoring uh, noted Virgin Islanders. Uh, we spoke to this already. And then we have Mr. Claude Maroon, who was also uh, from this community. He was a, 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 a photographer, um, one of several photographers. Every community had a photographer. Mr. Artley was in Down Street or in Savan. Uh, Mr. Abbott was also another photographer in the Upstreet area. His uh, studio was on Congens Garda um, at the um, the upper end of the of the uh, street. And this is actually Mr. Maloon's box camera. This was his first camera uh, that he saved his earnings and purchased, which is a Kodak camera that he. Um, gave to me for safekeeping and it is my desire to get it restored and when the museum is built to have that and his collection of photographs uh, be placed in the museum. And these are other photographs of his uh, from various time periods. So he did a lot of family photographs uh, 
And this picture of the elegant lady is my grandmother at the marriage of her brother-in-law in the family home. And he gave me that negative as a keepsake. So we have the upstreet community uh, established 1764, 1765, and we're moving through the period and our respective families uh, 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 likewise lived in various parts of our community. This is the uh, Peterson family. They were grocers and they were in Berger and Condens Garda. And this is a picture of two of her uh, two of their children, two of uh, five children, I think, um, George Peterson and Lorenzo Peterson, and the family uh, compound on the opposite side of the street, one building served as the grocery store and a uh, Airbnb. As in, yes, they had Airbnbs back then because Mr. Alfonso, George Alfonso Christian, when he came from St. Croix, he lived on the upper floor of this building here. And this, the family lived on the top and they rented uh, apartments on the lower level and they had a tenement yard. And this is uh, pictures of the yard. Uh, they, they had a gas station, one of the oldest gas stations on St. Thomas. This is the gas pump. This is my uncle, probably dressed to go to church or something, or maybe his birthday with his, his little scooter. My mom and uh, a brother and my uncle, in military service. This is a very interesting photograph uh, that speaks to advocacy and social consciousness. And I found it in a collection and it says, uh, the, let me see. Increase independence and decrease dependency. What do they mean by that? It means every tub should sit on its own bottom. So I'm sure they're using the image of the bathtub with a scrub board to represent that proverb. And this is Criterion Grocery here. This is the family home. And this is the grocery store with the uh, Airbnb on the top. <laughs> and unfortunately, this landmark was destroyed in the 2017 hurricane, which was devastating to the family. And uh, that's why this presentation and collective memory is so critical and important. And likewise, our celebrations, you know, that these, these homes and, you know, our struggle to maintain these homes and to restore them and to repurpose them um, also have so much memory uh, for community and family and friends. Uh, this is the Gold Street that uh, our families, Ruby and I, uh, lived on. Ruby, you want to speak a little about that? Sure. Um, Gold Street, which Myron said indicated as Princeton's Gata. Um, in the photo that we have on the right, you can see the building where his family had their grocery, and you said they also lived in the same building, Myron? Correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then across from, on the left-hand side in the two-story building, that is where the Olivers lived, um, Mara and um, e. Benjamin Oliver. You see the, going up the steps, and even the steps was a part of Princeton's Garden. That's the address. Lincoln School is on the right. As you come, if you're coming towards us in the picture, next to the Olivers, you can see a wooden fence. Well, Claude Malone's aunt, uh, her name was Elizabeth, we called her Miss Liz, she owned that property, and then later on, Claude Maloon's sister, Amy Maloon, who was also a teacher, she, um, she lived in that building, and she was godmother to many, many people in, in the community. So coming forward next to the Maloon building would have been another house where um, the Plaskett family, Mel Plaskett and their family lived there. And then the next property on this left-hand side is the building where my family lived. My great grandparents, James and Rose Ferris, lived there, and then my um, my grandparents lived there, and that's where my father and his brothers grew up. In that house, 15A Princeton's Garda is the address. And then across the street from them was um, my godmother Agatha Richardson. Her son, Chinka Richardson, just was buried a couple of weeks ago, 
his mother lived right across the street there on, on Gold Street as well. You know, I've always wondered why they called it Gold Street. But my father made a replica of the street and he made a replica of a little goat walking down Gold Street. So he, he kept it. <laughs> yes. I always, everybody asks that question, why Gold Street? But I, yes. it probably before they, they, they developed uh, for residential, it was part of a grass piece probably. where goats were. So, uh, and, you know, there were some, some areas that had big yards in the back, like the William Yard, for example. So yep. it's, a, it's, a, it's a real puzzle. <laughs> uh, this is uh, my, my father's family, Ohenio Jackson, who came from St. Croix with his mother and uh, Frederick Stead, and he married a, my grandmother from Tortola and they had eight children. He had 10 and they uh, had their grocery store and residence and on uh, Gold Street, which was moved from 7th Street from the Smedes. Right. Uh, when we talk about matriarchs of the family, uh, you know, photographs are very important and rare so that these disasters have taken toll, have taken a toll of family archives and uh, memorabilia. Uh, to have these images, it's very important that you copy them. And the St. Thomas graphic is a good example of images. Some of these images, uh, uh, the owners of them have, may have lost uh, the copy of the original photograph or um, the duplicate, which this collection offers an opportunity to get another copy of these images. Uh, this is my great grandmother from St. Croix. She was from Fredericksted. She was a domestic. She came to St. Thomas and she worked for the Galabert family. Uh, Ms. Galabert was a music teacher in Garden Street. This is Ms. Catherine Smalls Davis. And she was on the opposite side of the block and on Glass Bottle Alley. And then you have Ms. Catherine Smalls. Oh, this is wrong. This is uh, Ms. DeWint. And it probably, let's go back. Yeah, this is uh, the matriarch of the DeWin family. It's a duplicate uh, there, so excuse me for that. And uh, she lived on hospital line, and that was the James DeWin family. Myron, you're muted. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. All right. Did you, did you hear me about these photographs? Yes. Okay, very well. Okay, so, and, you know, customs are very important and in the collection you will find, especially for funeral booklets, you know, people brought in their original. Here's our original from Mr. and Mrs. Sewer of St. John. When they got married, you could see it stained. Uh, and uh, I, I probably got stained in the collection over a period of time. And uh, this is, you know, on St. John. Uh, when my aunt got married uh, to Hercules Williams, uh, Luella Jackson Williams and her family, and my aunt, and then uh, notice how the, 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 the pictures are all supposed uh, next to a, a round table, which was this, a very important furniture item in the household to have in the center. So these photographs tell us a thousand things in terms of home decors and the importance of particular pieces of furniture to families and heirlooms. Likewise, death, burial, and mourning traditions. We had a mourning period of one year. Uh, this is the death of my grandfather, Ohinio Jackson, uh, in 1960, and my aunts in morning, one from New York. I think you could tell which one came from New York. <laughs> uh, and then we have uh, my uh, youngest aunt, uh, who was very modern, and my conservative aunt, Luella, who died recently over a year ago um, in more um, traditional dress. Uh, likewise, the collections uh, these are additional photographs from uh, Mrs. Holga Sua and children. Ruby, you want to weigh in here? Yeah, well, um, 
the Saw family, and you know, my, my children are part of the Saw family. Miss Holder was their father's uh, stepmother. So in this picture, I believe you've got Llewellyn, Llewellyn Callis and Oswin. Oswin was my classmate and that's Elise sitting in, um, sitting in her mother's lap. And so the, the wedding picture you had before of the Soors in St. John was Miss Holder and her husband, Victor Soar, um, when they got married outside. And I suspect that St. Thomas Graphics probably um, did the funeral booklet for Ms. Holder when she died. Yes, and, she that's did. Probably, and that's probably why they have all these pictures. Um, she, she owned and managed uh, Holder Soar's guest house in St. John for many years. Um, and their, their family has been prominent in a number of ways. Her son, Ozan, was my classmate and we lost him a few years ago. But um, it's good that at least you've got St. John represented in here. And then I see you also have um, our former Lieutenant Governor, Derek Hodge. And so you have the St. Croix and you have the whole Virgin Islands basically represented in this collage of, of funeral booklets. And certainly you're right that funeral booklets not only talk about the funeral, but about the life of the people as pictures and stories are told and put in those. So funeral booklets have really become a, a major piece of archival material that we should really all hold on to. Thank you, Ruby. Uh -huh. And this is uh, Mr. E. Benjamin Oliver and Mrs. Maud Oliver. They uh, uh, relocated from St. Croix. Uh, Mr. Oliver was originally from Montserrat and his, uh, his family members, his descendants, uh, uh, the O'Briens, the Molloy, not Molloy. Ross is in St. Croix. Yeah, the Ross, the Ross, not Molloy, Ross. Ebe Eberson. And the Epperson family. Yes. Uh, today, so uh, former Senator James O'Brien, this would be his great grandfather. And again, the photograph of him on the back porch of the balcony of the school. Ruby? Okay, so this is my family. Um, the photograph shows my great grandfather, James Ferris, who's standing, his wife. I, in some records, she's Rose, and some she's Rosa, some she's Rosina, but she's Rose Johannes Ferris from St. Croix. The young lady in the middle is my grandmother, Hildred Ferris, who mar married Henry Simmons, who was a police officer. And these are three of their sons. They had, um, I believe, the Older boys by that time had left and moved to New York. So from the left to the right in the photograph, the youngest one is Millward, who was in the Navy. And I found him in a census record on, on a ship in uh, 1920. And then uh, the next one is Ralph, after whom my father Ralph was named. And the bigger son sitting on the right of the picture is Ivan. They used to call him Bounce. He, these are, well, Bounce is the only son that didn't leave the Virgin Islands and go to New York. Um, Ralph and Millward eventually left. And in fact, Millward's travel record, you, you showed some records earlier of, you know, people seeking permission to travel and so forth. Millward's travel record is um, among that collection as well. The document, to the, and I should say this picture, I believe, was actually taken in the yard of the property at 15 A Princess Garda, because I recognized the coconut tree and some of the buildings that were still around when I was growing up, when you know we would go to visit my grandmother. The record to the right is the 1911 census, and so it lists the names of the people, the very people in this photograph. And James Ferris himself was the one who recorded the census. Although he was the parent, the property actually belonged to his children. He put his property in his children's names and I have documents that show the whole lineage of, of the property. And fortunately today, my aunt still lives in that house and the property has been in our family for over a hundred years. But it lists James Ferris as the head of the household, Rose, his wife, um, Ivan, Hillsred, Ralph, and Millward. And, you know, Myron, I think when we do our second part of this discussion uh, in the next couple of weeks, as we talk about the socioeconomic development, we might want to talk about why a number of families from St. Croix migrated to St. Thomas and settled in the upstreet area, because it seems both your family and mine and a number of others that we do know came out of St. Croix. And it might be, a, you know, it might be useful to have the discussion when we 
Get into the center of it, please. Uh -huh. um, you need to spell my name right, you know, then it <laughs> Lord have mercy. <laughs> Will do. Sorry about that. All right. We're going to move on to um, <laughs> Naval Bandmaster Alton Adams Sr. and family who relocated to the upstreet community after the devastating fire uh, that destroyed the family home on Bunker Hill. Uh, known to us in the Garden Street community. Uh, he lost uh, this daughter, Merle, in the fire. And my mother was there that morning at the fire because she had just arrived. Uh, so in our oral history, we know about this fire from the time we were children. And uh, she's probably one of the last survivors that actually could tell you firsthand of the fire that happened that morning when her grandmother sent her to spend the day with the Adams family uh, from upstreet uh, to Garden Street or so Bunker Hill. So um, you could see the tennis court here and the family compound, which was part of the naval um, in holdings. And when those buildings were decommissioned, Mr. Adams bought the house, which is one of the oldest residents in the upstreet community. And likewise, the public spaces, we spoke about the parade grounds, which is now Lionel Roberts Stadium. You could see here uh, the, this, where the footprint of the stadium, the, the New Hansen Hospital, the cemeteries, and all of this green space, which was used for um, for development at a later date. I'm trying to get this. Okay, there we go. Uh, belief systems uh, are also part uh, um, of Virgin Islands and it's a way of life. This is the Moravian Church, Memorial Moravian Church after service. It's a very rare photograph. Uh, mm -hmm. You could tell at the time, uh, pride people took at the time, uh, I'm going to church and presenting themselves and their family. And it's a really beautiful photograph of after a Sunday morning mass. Then Mr. Adolf Deng Sexto. So here we are. Uh, Ruby, you wanna speak a little about him? Um. Mr. Sexto was the father of a teacher who many of us knew, uh, Ms. Inez Harvey. She was my ninth grade English teacher. But the thing for which Mr. Sexto is primarily known was his book called Time and I Are Looking Forward. It was, I suppose, a prophetic kind of um, work. He was a philosopher. And um, I know that Mr. Gurdy talked about him a lot. I suspect that they were. They, they, they knew each other well. Um, I can't tell you a whole lot about Mr. Sixto, only that I do know that his book is something that many of the older people had in, um, in their collections. In fact, the late Dr. Ruth Thomas had a copy of his book. And when we, after the hurricane, when we went to help her out and clear out stuff, I found her copy, but it was severely wet and moldy and, you know, really was not in, in good shape, but it was a book that many older Virgin Islanders had on their shelves because he was somebody whom they admired and uh, who made a name for himself. Yeah, I can't read it was there. It's too, it's too small for me to read it. Otherwise yeah. I would take a closer look at that. Yeah, he was born in February 17, 1858. He was from Vieques, Puerto Rico. His mother was a native of St. Thomas. Uh, and they, uh, she moved her family, the family to St. Thomas uh, when he was a child. Uh, it was on St. Thomas that Ding, D-I-N-G, an affectionate nickname that everyone called him, learned to know and love his beloved St. Thomas. And when he uh, endeared himself to the people, it was there that he received his early education, followed by independent study 
acquiring most of his education. By this independent study, he became a self, he became self-educated and he was a man of culture. So, um, you know, he was a patron of the arts, uh, the theater, um, the community theater, which sits on the footprint of which is now um, the Ola Apollo Theater and now a parking lot, uh, which will be the home for the uh, new museum, Civic and Cultural Center. Uh, was one of the places that he spent a lot of time and he was the father of Inez Harvey, educator. And she did this book uh, in his honor. And what was very interested in the books is also the ads from the Virgin Islands, Edward, Edward H. Maroon from St. Thomas, uh, who owned, uh, which is Black Bear's Castle, Blue Bear's Castle today, he actually had a residence there. Uh, Jay Piwanski, the father of uh, Governor and Isidore Piwanski, Om uh, Delanos, or Delanos, Panama Hats. That's Delanois. Oh, Delanois. Uh -huh. Okay. Delanois. And I believe that might be part of Nadine Machena's family, I think. Probably. And they have the um, O'Neill, and I can't read this one because I have uh, images over it. Uh, then you have the St. Thomas Tedinden. Um, Nolte puts in an ad, the bulletin, the, and the, the bulletin. Uh, Jose Sproul, East Sproul uh, from St. John, uh, who has a business on Main Street on St. Thomas. Fabio's from St. Quarry, who are also in St. Thomas on the train. And the St. Thomas I Ice Manufacturing Company, A.H. Reese, uh, which was later purchased by the Piwanski family. Then in the collection, you'll find, uh, you know, various uh, photographs that were used for various testimonials and activities, like for the Little League, you have Cletus Clendenin and Queen Alison Molina and the Little League in this, right down to our very own Tim Duncan in the collection. Mm -hmm. uh, within this community were several doctors. Uh, the oldest, of course, Newt Hansen. That's how we got Newt Hansen Hospital. Here in this photograph, you see Dr. Andrews. They lived uh, off of the Coconut Park. It later became Roosevelt Park. And Dr. Heat uh, had a drugstore, which is uh, Dr. Alfred Heat would be the newer generation, as well as Dr. Warren Smith, who came after uh, this. They would be the early group of Virgin Islanders during the American period that went into medicine and, and became physicians. Uh, the forum, uh, is also within the collection and they really um, have a variety of topics, you know, from uh, celebrations to political discourse. And we have to thank uh, um, yeah. Senator Baldemar Hill Sr. Uh, for his work and his children, his sons, uh, for doing this forum. And you could see um, in basically the forward or the editorial that he puts in here. I can't read it uh, to you, but uh, there was a tribute to him, a, mem a memory of Valdemar Ehil, uh, who died in 1976 and then rise to recognition, uh, an account of US Virgin Islanders from slavery to self-government. Then you get into other aspects of the collection, like the arts, they have Eric and Rhoda Tillett for Jim Tillett, that, that entity still exists, run by one of the sons, and they moved here from the United States and they used the, the old um, farm estate of the Christensen family and converted it into uh, Tillett Gardens, which they printed fabric and uh, did silk screening and other aspects until they, it's a, a haven for um, local entrepreneurs in the arts and uh, business. Including culinary arts. Culinary arts too as well, correct. Mm -hmm. And then you go through, you find pageant celebrations, boards and commissions, and you know, the board members actually sent in uh, a photograph, they went to a studio, they had a photographer do a professional photograph of them. And these images are inside of this collection. Uh, another publication, The Pride, uh, 
which I believe was done by uh, Earl B. Atley, exactly. uh, which was printed. Uh, they did other work uh, for other uh, journalists and printers. And you, in the collection, uh, I found these images of Isidore Paiwanski uh, and his 90th birthday with his daughter, Avna Casamel, and their grandchildren as part of the, uh, the collection for the St. Thomas Chamber of Commerce, which we'll speak to in our next uh, series. And then you have Eyewitness Account of Slavery in the Danish West Indies, which Isidore Paiwanski published, not published by the St. Thomas Graphics, however. Ambassador Terence Tadman, who was also from this community, uh, was adapted by Mr. J. Antonio Jarvis. Uh, this comes out of Mr. J. Antonio Jarvis' book. Uh, one of his publications with the class and uh, the seventh uh, to 12th grade class, uh, which he says the Charlotte Omni High School graduates, 40 or 50 students a year, the cream of 800 enrolled from seven to 12th grade. So imagine then 800 students. And then you have Ambassador Tadman uh, here as a high school student and he served in World War II, and uh, he was uh, the younger of a GI who was a student at Puerto Rico Polytechnical Institute when his number was called. Mm -hmm. You want to say anything on this, uh, Ruby? Um, no, no, go, go ahead. Okay, all right. Uh, I'll let you speak to this because you have a little more are you a little more familiar with the fraternity than I am? <laughs> All right, so um, testimonials and banquets, and here's a picture of the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity, which happens to be my husband's fraternity. So I recognize a number of people. They must have had some kind of a big they celebration. Were, yeah. They were honoring Ambassador Todman. Todman. And in the picture in the center, if I start from the left in the front, I'll name the ones I recognize. There are some who I, I don't. But you've got uh, George Almera Christian. You have Rudy Krieger. Uh, Ambassador Todman in the middle. Next to him is Governor Roy Schneider. Going across the back, you've got the late Senator Elmo Roebuck. Um, let's see. Vernon Finch is, is here in the middle. And I know Vernon is on this call, so he can see himself. Uh, you've got the late Judge Ishmael Myers, Governor Charles Turnbull is there, Gary Sproul, uh, Dr. Warren Smith, and there's some other people in there, but the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity is the oldest black fraternity, and they have quite a history, and they have quite a presence here in the Virgin Islands. In fact, I believe the St. Croix chapter just celebrated their 51st anniversary yesterday, so, you know, hail to the... If I thank you, Ruby. Uh -huh. And this was a very big gala, and, and these photographs were think Ibas. Uh, um, his last name is Edwards, and I think he was employed at that time at the office of the governor. Cosmo. And uh, they're part of the collection. Many of the individuals who attended the gala um, were, have never seen these images before. Um, there's over a hundred images uh, of this particular event. Wow. Uh, and here we have uh, culture, composer, businessman, Bill Lamara and his significant other, his wife, who was also a community activist and musician, Mrs. Joyce Lamara. Um, here, come back to the Virgin Islands, which is a very uh, popular and famous uh, song that was composed by Bill Amada. The family came from St. Croix, the Mata family, and they were musicians here in, uh, on St. Croix and in St. Thomas and traveled as our ambassadors. And this Virgin Islands folk song um, was done by the St. Thomas graphics. And you could see the score for Roll as a Bill and Roll, I think, is the score that is covered on my screen, but it, we call it that is. But yeah, that's what's there. Yeah. Would you like to say anything on this slide? Right. Um, in addition to the folk songs that Bill Lamada did, um, there is a African-American Lutheran hymnal that was published um, 
some quite some time ago, but in that hymnal is a song composed by Bill Amata. It's called Have You Thanked the Lord? And uh, to have a Virgin Alna have his his composition in that hymnal, I think is quite significant. And uh, it's something that we use here, but you know, people in Lutherans in other parts of the country also are now familiar with his work because of that particular hymnal. Thank you, Ruby. Uh -huh. Then we move to St. John again, and in that collection, uh, Mr. Doris Jordan, an American who moved here with a husband who was a Russian tenor who had belonged to the Royal Opera in Russia and had uh, uh, left Russia as um, uh, he left because of communism and came to the United States and they relocated to St. John. So after his death, she created the Ivan Jordan Museum where faith and freedom met in one man's life where she memorialized her husband and his quest for freedom. And she is printing a calendar. So that's where you have January and images of him, which is a bus. And, and members of the uh, museum board and friends here in um, Cruz Bay St. John. And these are just images of, of street uh, that shows a variety of buildings, the vernacular, uh, the masonry, urban renewal took out so many of these buildings that the street, streetscape is not recognizable from, for many uh, if you were to take this photograph and walk down the street today. So it had an impact on, on the culture and the uh, politics and the life of the people of this community when urban renewal came in and took out so much of the housing, but did not replace it in kind. A state hospital ground. A history uh, of a community, just one neighborhood uh, in the Virgin Islands and where a collection has um, provided a collective memory of who we are as a people. I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Rob Upson, Mr. Amy Caron, Dr. Ruby Simmons, Miss Yvette Finch, uh, Mrs. Bernice P. Jackson, Sophia O'Bain, Miss Othelia DeWint, Miss Susan Lugo, and all others who made this possible. And also the various collections, the St. Thomas Graphic Collection, Caribbean Genealogy Library, Clark Malone Photo Collection, Clinton and Peterson Collection, Myron D. Jackson Collection, We From Upstreet Incorporated, the Enid Bar Library Collection, the U.S. National Archives, Private Collections, the Community Foundation of the Virgin Islands, the National Foundation for the Humanities and the State Historic Preservation Office. Ruby? Um, I just want to say thank you to, first of all, to you, Myron, for giving me the opportunity to share this with you, because you could have gone ahead and just done your own presentation. So I'm Happy to have had an opportunity to be a part of this. And I want to thank everyone who is sharing with us. I've been looking at the chat and I know that people have a, quite a number of questions and I look forward to us engaging with them now as we, uh, as you wrap the, the, the presentation and we get a chance to dialogue with those who have come to share this with us. Thank you so much. And thank you for taking the time out of uh, your schedule to participate. And I want to thank all those who have participated in this forum today. Thank you. That was fascinating. Thank you. Well, it was really interesting. Thank you very much, Senator Andrew. I believe Rob is going to moderate the questions or Sophia, are you going to do it? There are 64 things in the chat. Do we, so. do, we need, do we need to stop so that they could come back on? Well, if we stop, they should be able to. Oh, OK. Can you hear me OK? OK, we can hear you now. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. OK, Th sorry. Thank you, Myron. Thank you, Ruby. I was saying every time that I hear you both speak, I learn something new. And indeed, I think half of the content today was something new to me. And I'm so glad that we are getting you to present and share what you know with the community and that it'll be recorded. We'll have it on your web page for this presentation as soon as possible. And we're looking forward, Ruby, for you and Myron to follow up 
on September 25th. So to the right. audience, uh, look for those invites. It will be at 2 p.m. on Saturday, September 25th with a follow-up. Um, today we heard mostly from Myron. I think on the 25th we're going to hear mostly from Ruby. Well, we're going to be talking Again, about I, I want... politics and so on. So I guess I will have a bit more to say, yes. Oh. Yes. <laughs> So uh, again, this is another opportunity for me to mention that this is part of a grant that was funded by the Community Foundation of the Virgin Islands um, and the National Endowment of Humanities under the CARES Act. This was the, I think the fourth of uh, what sounds like five, but maybe more uh, presentations we'll have. There is a link in the chat to the grant webpage if you want to explore the collection further. You may look at that page. Much of the materials are now available online, but you're also welcome to contact Caribbean Genealogy Library and uh, reserve a time to visit and look through the collection in person. So starting with the q and I did have a couple that I, I saw during the talk that I'd want to first pose to you both, Myron and Ruby. The first one for Senator Jackson was, could you share where some of the photos um, you presented were found, but in particular, one was of the Ber the Berg's home in the photo. Oh, sure. Um, over the life of my 40 years in government and, and 30 years in historic preservation and culture, uh, the images came into historic preservation in addition to old postcards. Uh, that I purchased, and then the Enid Bar Library and Archives, the Van Schulten Collection, has an extensive photo collection that's not accessible to the community, unfortunately, and I trust that as, as uh, stewards that we could put some, some muscle, some pressure on uh, our government to do better in making sure that library archives and museums best serve us as a community because we're grossly underserved in that regards. So these collections, um, over a period of time, we, we did a, on the 90th anniversary of the transfer, we did a hundred years in black and white. So I had the opportunity to go into the collection and to select photographs and that no one, most people have not seen in, in modern times, in addition to uh, the Danish National Archives, uh, many Danes who lived here had photo albums and they in turn, uh, when they uh, died, their family members turned those albums over to the Royal Danish Library. Uh, and so you have a collection of photographs coming from various sources. Um, there's a tremendous amount of images on the uh, accessible on the internet. And you can also go up on the um, Danish Royal uh, Archives website. And you could also download images uh, uh, from the 1600s. We don't, we don't have a touch. Okay. Okay. Somebody has their mic on. I think Kathy O'Gara, if you could uh, turn your mic on. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you, Meyer. The next question came from Kimberly Samuel, and it was um, here. It, it, Kimberly, if you're there, you can ask it yourself. Otherwise, I'll um, go ahead and, and read it. It was from earlier in the presentation. Feel free to unmic yourself and ask the question related to um, photos. I'm here. Great. Would you like to ask, ask the question yourself? Yes, hi. I have some photos that were damaged from Hurricane um, Hugo, and they're stuck to the actual um, page in the, photo, in the photo album, and a couple have water damage. I know I need to restore all of them as far as making a new print, but are you aware of any applications or people who provide service for photo restoration? I checked in a place in Virginia because I'm living in Maryland, it was like a couple hundred dollars to restore just one photo. Some folks have made suggestions on um, some sites and stuff to go to, but I'm very wary about turning over all my family photos to an online person and not knowing if I'm going to get them back. 
I, I would say that it's, it is an expensive venture to have them professionally done. I would suggest that you speak with historic preservation or you better yet with Susan Lugo of the library because over the years we've had um, archives that have been impacted and similarly we've found ourselves in a very similar situation. And there are entities that can restore your photographs. Of course, you know, when they're stuck together, you, they, they, they have to be treated um, with, with careful attention. So I would defer that question to Ms. Susan Lugo, uh, who's associated with the Caribbean Genealogy Library, and I'm sure she would be able to provide you with uh, um, several entities associated with museums and archives that does uh, restoration. Thanks, Mark. I yeah, I know Ms. Lugo. Go ahead, Kimberly. I was just thinking, okay, Ms. I was gonna say thanks. Go ahead, Kimberly. Thank, Thank you. you. Rob, go ahead. Okay, if you're finished, yeah, uh, Ms. Lugo, great. She's, uh, I know she's on the call. She's posted some information in the chat for everyone to take a look at, and uh, I know that will be valuable. I see uh, Ms. Gwen Mulinar has a question. She's already on mic. Gwen, would you like to uh, ask the question now? Yes, thank you so very much. I'd first like to thank uh, the Caribbean Genealogical Library for serving as the guardians for this outstanding collection. Thank you so very much and, and writing the grant to find ways to make it accessible to the public and to both uh, Senator Jackson and Dr. Uh, Isanison for their brilliant uh, presentations and, 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 and explaining uh, some of the photographs. So I have a question for the um, CGL and then a question for for Myron and for Ruby. So let me ask for the, um, for the uh, CGL first. What are your plans for, the, um, for this collection? Do you uh, envision um, further, further activities associated with the collection? What do, you, what do you see for the future for this collection? Yes, Gwen, this is um, you know, one of maybe four or five projects that could be done to develop the collection even further. And the uh, library has a committee that we've established to discuss uh, priorities and how to move forward. If you're interested in joining that committee, uh, feel free to email the library and share your interest with either volunteering, um, either as a committee member or with scanning or inventorying. Um, there's many possible projects. So if you're interested in assisting with the development of the collection, please email the library. Great, thank you. And that's also the, the question for Myron uh, or, or Ruby. That, that one photograph that you have that shows the, um, the location of, of, the, um, of the graphics as, as well as on the left showing the, um, the ballpark uh, before it became the stadium. It explained to me what, when I was growing up and you ask people where they were going or where they were living, they would say, I live around the coast. I live around the coast. And I used to wonder why it was called the coast because it wasn't close to any water. But it later was brought to my attention that what they were really saying was around the course, C-O-U-R-S-E, and they were referring sure. To that open area, and as well, right. I saw the I saw that right. photograph. I yeah. saw the open area. It is, <laughs> I live around the course, you know, and <laughs> and it really it really highlights it so beautifully. Yeah. And the second thing is that um, there was another uh, horse race area besides that course, that horse race course, and it's shown in that other photograph that you showed that, but you didn't mention it. It was when you have the long view up the Polyberg Hill. I forgot what the name of that street is that you referred. When you have that long view and you look at the very far distant part of that photograph, there's another course area right. that was another horse race track. And that right. was the area 
where the the Snyder the hospital now is right. and the CAH school. That area there was another course. Right. Um, and um, th that's the only photograph, Myron, that I've seen of that particular course. So that makes that one really very, very priceless. Yes. What, you know, when you mentioned that the, the, race, the racetrack in Sugar Estate, the one where the hospital is now. And I grew up knowing yeah. that because I grew up in Sugar Estate and we would go on the roof to look at the races because, you know, of course my parents wouldn't let us go to the races at that time. But I, I'm not sure which of the pictures has a view of that that track you were talking about that's in Sugar Estate. Was it something in the presentation? I'm today? wondering, if, I'm wondering was, if that's what it was. It, it was in the picture of Hospital Line, Gold Street, but Glass Battle Alley. Yes, but yes. Really uh, depth uh, photographs. So you see Sugar Estate in the distance. Okay, so you're exactly. So seeing, you're seeing Estate, Estate Sugar, well, Estate Sugar, Thomas. Estate Thomas, yes. Right, in it because I get at that period of time it was rural and we know that that was a cattle and, and okay. prior to that it was a sugar again, yes. Right. So they moved the track from a wrong hospital estate, hospital ground, and they moved it to sugar estate. So those of us of a certain age would know the sugar estate race track right. and our grandparents, our great grandparents would know around the coast around the course. And the mahogany trees delineate the racetrack. If you go to around Birds Home, and that's why it's so important to preserve that historic landscape and preserve those trees. Wow. Hope that uh, uh, responds to your question, Dr. Mullen. Yes, and the last photograph, Myron, is the one that you have it's called King's Quarter Up Street, that one photograph. Uh, and there were two buildings that were totally unknown to me. I've never seen those two buildings before. Um, there were two buildings on the left in that one that you have labeled King's Quarter Up Street. Do you have access to that uh, easily, King's Quarter Up Street? I can't go back into the presentation, but what I'll do offline, I'll go back and look, okay. and then I'll, I'll yes. text you and let you know. Thank you so very much. And again, congratulations to both of you and Ruby. Beautiful, beautiful presentation. Thank you. Um, I think some people next, have raised their hands, Rob. Yes, next we have a question from Ms. Sehi. Go ahead, Ms. Sehi. Yeah. And you're on mute, so I'm gonna ask you to unmute yourself now. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you hear me now? Great. Am I yes, heard can. now? Okay, hi, okay. so that's yes, Boy please. here. Okay, I got a couple of questions, but before I, I before I do the question, I do have an announcement. My aunt, um, Ida Potter Killing, who is the athlete runner, the one who you know was running and doing all of that that I used to post on, she did pass on actually the twenty eighth of August, the day that Hurricane. Ida became a category two hurricane. So Ida Potter Killing, who was the athlete and gold uh, award winner um, on several events, started at age 67 and died at 106 years old, just passed. So I just wanted to let that out there because many people know, and she's related to several names here. Enos Barr was her cousin. Joe, uh, Joe Potter was her cousin. Uh, the Crickies. Uh, I can go on and on and on, but just to put that information out. Okay, so my question is um, early on when you showed the, um, thanks Valerie, <laughs> uh, very on when you showed the pictures when people were leaving the island, um, going to the States. And I, I invited one of my cousins, um, um, Mr. Potter here. And they were going from here to like New York and the various places and they had to file. Because uh, we've been looking and, you know, some of the records came out of the BVI as well. If they and some of the individuals left the BVI and they when they left here, they did when they left the Virgin Islands, they didn't leave from the BVI. They left from St. Thomas and, uh, you know, St. Croix and wherever to it's mostly St. Thomas. Are those records available for those individuals as well? Did they take the pictures? Do Are those records? Can I find some of those um um, that material 
for them there in that same catalog? I, I, I think uh, the Caribbean Genealogy Library to speak to it, Susan Lugo, you have Miss Nady Machina Ken who extensively work and others, Dr. Simmons, I could also weigh in on this. Uh, that collection is out of the Records 55 at College Park, Maryland. Okay. And you have to remember that citizenship wasn't granted till 27, 28. Right. So for 10 years, Virgin Islanders had no status. They weren't American citizens. Right. And mm -hmm. they, likewise, they were extensively traveling prior to these islands becoming the United States, Virgin, or Virgin Islands of the United States. Mm -hmm. and, you know, they would go to school in Antigua, uh, in other islands, South America, the Dominican Republic, Cuba, you know, all over the Caribbean, Europe, and likewise. So the, I, I know that using Ancestry.com for my own research, uh, from time to time, I would get a hit, and that hit would be a passenger listing uh, for a family member that I didn't really know even traveled to the destination that it lists. Uh, so that you have a lot of the, the um, travel back and forth. And then in the various newspapers, they listed arrivals and departures. So you could use those as well. You may not get a photograph, but you would get uh, who were the passengers leaving from St. Croix to St. Thomas, uh, who were leaving to go to, um, to another destination. So they have several sources, and I'm sure the Caribbean genealogy could uh, guide you accordingly in this regard. Okay, thank you. And there was another one. Oh, and the, my last one is, and it's not really sorry. a question, it's Ms. actually a request. Ms. Floyd, I'm, I'm sorry, to, Ms. Floyd, I'm sorry mm -hmm. to cut you off, but we have several other people asking questions. Do you oh, mind? No. I was gonna say an answer to what uh, Mr. Jackson said was, um, if you have any questions about research for your family, right. feel free to email them to CGL okay. and this is the not, volunteers that will try to answer. This is not a question. This is a request. And the request is like earlier on, y'all sent out the, because I tried to join the, um, the library on several occasions and I can't get in. So can you please email out the, the link directly to us um, in our emails? Because every time I try to get in by coming in through uh, the genealogy li um, library, I cannot log on to get my, um, to get directly in. That's my other request. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. We have three more questions in line. Let's try to get to all of them before the top of the hour. First off is from Ms. Ann Comment. Uh, um, comment. Sorry, Anna Comment. Asking you to unmute now. If you'd like to ask your Yes. Question. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, Anna May. Well, first of all, uh, Myra and Ruby, uh, I think I can call you Myra and Ruby since we are contemporaries and <laughs> have done much work together. A uh, wonderful presentation. I was just enthralled uh, with all the information and uh, the pictures. And Myra, my, my question was, we both work on the uh, Folklife Festival in 1990, and I remember them saying that these archives would be available to Virgin Islanders. And I wondered if you had any uh, information on that because the, the scope of the work and research done during that festival was so vast uh, that there should be quite a lot of uh, information, including pictures and videos that are available there. You, you are correct. Um, anime and how we hello and greetings. Uh, they, yes, the, the Center for Folk Life uh, Studies or the Center for Folk Life uh, Smithsonian Institution um, has the negatives, they have the recordings, they have the field documentation for it. Uh, you can make an inquiry. I, I will speak with Dr. Curran or send him a note and ask him how is the best way to access. But the information is available and uh, accessible. Of course, the music aspect, folk life, way, uh, folk life ways, uh, from time to time, they have um, also issued a CD most recently, Stanley and the Ten Sleepless Night, have been included mm -hmm. in their series. Uh, but the actual field work that was done 
and the photographs that each uh, researcher did and the uh, tradition bearers, many of whom did not go to the Folklife Festival. And that's why I, I labeled uh, the photographs the way I did or the, um, the segments the way I did, belief systems, uh, burial traditions, because these were conversations that we had with Virgin Islanders. And uh, Absolutely. it was very interesting when we were talking, well, the, the individuals that I focused on and I would ask them, like for example, when they gave birth, they would explain to me how many days they would have to be in bed. Uh, then there was, after so many days, the, the, there was a particular day where they would walk out with their baby, which would be outside of the home, exposed to the sun, uh, the baths that their mothers and grandmothers and nannies and elders did for them, the banning of the stomach, and then the same with burial traditions, the length of mourning, how you mourn from black to black and white, to mauve, to, uh, to, to you came out in white. I was just fascinated with this information. And it really, uh, at the time uh, for Virgin Islanders, uh, for in this time, especially where we are losing so many to COVID and other illnesses, we're losing a tremendous amount of uh, oral history and our collective memory. And I would encourage everyone to take some time and to record, to document, to share your memories and your stories passed down to you because after we leave, then who tells those stories? Absolutely. And uh, the reason I brought up the uh, Smithsonian is because I can very well see some collaboration between the GCL and the Smithsonian as far as their archives and the information that they have compiled uh, during that important uh, Folklife Festival. Thank you. Thank you. It for would be an added, it, it would definitely be an added uh, resource yes. for Virgin Islanders. Truly, yes. And I'm sure that they, there is, they make uh, to institutions, they make this information accessible. So I'm sure our inquiry would uh, answer that question. Yes. Thank you again, Ruby and Myron. Very interesting. Keep up the good work. You're welcome, and it's good to see you, Anna. I, mean, I know you're always a part of these anyhow. So thank you very much. Yes. 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 Thanks. Uh -huh. Ms. Coleman, please feel free to email the genealogy libraries if you have a proposal for that partnership. It sounds like a great idea. Mm -hmm. uh, next up, we have a question from Stacy Bourne. Free to answer the question. And then I think we'll take one more before we wrap up after that, Ms. Uh, Ms. Davis, after that. Good afternoon. This is Stacy Bourne. Thank you, Hi, Myron, and thank you, Ruby, for a really excellent presentation. Um, I think that one thing that really, really struck me is that you talked about funeral booklets and funeral booklets being this kind of instrumental um, element of having these photographs for the past. And, you know, we've been printing funeral booklets since 1998. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how appropriate it is, but something that has just struck me today during the course of this presentation that I have information that I think could be useful. And not that it's my information, because it's I didn't create it, I didn't curate it, and not that it's my copyrighted information, but I have, I'm absolutely positive I have hundreds of funeral booklets. And if funeral booklets, this is just an idea, if funeral booklets are a part of the way that we kind of keep track of history or a mechanism, um, I certainly would be willing to participate in some kind of forum or group of printers or form that gets submitted to printers so that we could forward information or just something, I don't know, but something inside of me today says that we have in our possession a lot of history that after we're all gone, we'll still speak to those legacies. And I don't know if it's a legal thing or a copyright thing or what thing it is, but somehow or another, I think that that information deserves to be um, categorized and put somewhere for some kind of reference. So I just wanted to open up um, that idea to you and certainly however you think that we could participate in something like that, I would be willing to do that. Thank you're, you. You're on point, Stacey, and 
Uh, some other printers uh, in the territory have been given uh, to the library in the past, and the, and then those those of us who collect uh, go to funerals and have them in our collection have given them to the Caribbean Genealogy Library and other depositories on St. Croix as well. So you're right on point, and I'm sure that uh, the uh, representatives uh, hear you loud and strong, and uh, they would make it possible. Um i just like to add, I think that what Stacy says makes a whole lot of sense. And in addition to us just contributing, I think if through the Caribbean Genealogy Library, we set up a committee that looks specifically, speaks specifically to the collection of funeral booklets, because I think when Suzanne did her presentation, we talked about Mr., and his name has gone out of my head, who also did a lot of funeral booklets. You know, if there, if there is some mechanism put in place to make sure that, you know, um, these things can be passed on in a routine sort of way and legally without any questions or problems from the families. I think that if there's something agreed to and more formalized, so it's not a haphazard thing that people would just contribute the booklets. I think I, it sounds to me like that's what Stacy is suggesting that we have something a little more formalized to make sure that we can collect from all the printers who have um, you know, done these things over the years and continue to make sure that it will go on into the future. Thank you very much, Stacy. Mm -hmm. Do we Thank have one more question? question? And I think our last last question for today from Christine Garrett Davis. I really enjoyed the presentation. Thank you very much. But um, my question relates to um, I wasn't born here. I grew up in Jersey and relocated here, but I understand from some of older family members that um, I had some connections to people in Gold Street, but by the time I came down here to live, that generation had passed away, and I don't know how to research that. You know, I only know that my grandfather, Alan Smith, was a policeman in St. Thomas, and he lived in that area, so if I could get some suggestions on how to do that research, I could put my email in the chat for a follow-up. Would that be okay? Yes, thank you for your question. And I, right off the top of my head, I would tell you, pay attention to the census records and for that particular area. Um, it's tedious, but um, you know, through search engines, even names come up and they'll pop up a census record for the Virgin Islands. So that's one way, and uh, Dr. Simmons, uh, she, she demonstrated using the census record for her family and Princeton's Garda. Uh, and I've, I've, most of us that have worked in Virgin Islands records, we rely on the census records for the household and, and the relationship and the, um, the, the professions and other information that it provides their religion how old are they, you know, when they came to the Virgin Islands in some cases. So uh, you, it's not difficult. It just requires patience. And so, the Caribbean Genealogy Library could guide you accordingly as well. And I could do that search put, electronically? Sure. If you put your email in, address in the chat, I'd be willing to get back in touch with you and try to, you know, steer you through some of the things you might need to do to, to, to find your family, okay? Thank you. So once I get your email address, I'll be in touch with you, okay? Great, Th thank you very much, Ruby. Thank you very much, Myron. And again, just, just proving Caribbean Genealogy Library is 100% volunteer run and it's dedicated researchers like Ruby and, and Myron, which you know add their knowledge to people who come in looking to do research that, uh, that help us all get to where we are. So thank you very much. That ends today's session. Uh, again, look forward for a follow-up session on September 25th at 2 p.m. Uh, if you aren't already part of our mailing list, you can go to our website and join the mailing list. And otherwise, you can keep checking on Facebook or through your other contacts. And I'm going to stop the recording now, and this is the official end of the session. Everyone have a great rest of your weekend. Thank you.
Thank you very, very much and happy Labor Day.